Wendell, are you ready to get nasty with the Nasferatu? <laughs> Nasferatu is ready to go. All right, so in this video, we're going to show you guys uh, what we put together with FreeNAS as the software. So we're building a NAS. Uh, Wendell, is yours going to be for the home, or what's, where could this be? I mean, pretty much anywhere, home, business, small business, I, probably small business. Yeah, this is a really good solution for small and medium business. Even in a large business as a backup appliance, just because of the iSCSI and just because of the way that it exposes its snapshots, like as if it was shadow copy and that sort of thing. So, so what we're really going to do in this video is just show you what we uh, put together. And in part two, Wendell's going to get really into the software so you guys can get a really good feel for what you can do with FreeNAS. Uh, to start off here, Wendell, you have built NASFARA2. Yes. Have you not? This is NAS Ferratu, Azeroc uh, Z77, but it's not a really super awesome choice for this. You want to look for, if you're going to do the ITX build to have a lot of horsepower, you really want to look for something that's got an Intel NIC, so high performance, that kind of thing. You really want to look for something that's relatively modern, like Z77, Z87. It doesn't have to be the Z77 or Z87 chipset. If you find an ITX board that's on sale or really cheap and has a chipset that supports error-correcting RAM, uh, go for it because error correcting RAM, you can get unbuffered error correcting RAM for only a few dollars more than regular RAM. If you have the opportunity to do it, you should, but it's not an absolute hard and fast requirement. Um, and it also, the other thing I like about this case is it fits a standard ATX power supply, even though it's tiny. So I can, I can run a lot of power hungry drives on it and maybe do a couple other things. With the FreeNAS Jails functionality, which lets you run other operating systems, you can. there's a version of Debian that'll run inside a FreeBSD jail with the FreeBSD kernel, which is sort of an unholy abomination, hence Nasferatu. Uh, <laughs> but you can it. do it. And you can also run a Plex Media Server and a whole bunch of other plugins and have a lot of horsepower because it's basically a full ITX system. Um, the motherboard that I'm using is a, a BioStar that I would not recommend that you use for a NAS build. Uh, it only has a few SATA ports, and I really had to improvise a little bit. But I also used a Lee and Lee case that will support a full-size uh, ATX um, uh, power supply. And again, when you're thinking ITX, a lot of times you do not think uh, about power. You're like, oh, it's ITX. It's a little system. I don't need a lot of power. Well, yes, if you're running 15 hard drives or whatever, you're going to need a lot of power. So I'm only running three hard drives in mine, but the uh, Lee and Lee PC Q18 that I'm using has space. Uh, enough that you could run five or six hard drives uh, with uh, FreeNAS running, uh, you know, with ZFS, you want to run uh, an odd number of drives. So power two plus one. So I'm running three drives. So that gives me two drives. And then the third one becomes parity uh, just for redundancy purposes and that sort of thing. So what we're going to do for you guys is we're going to list some of the parts that we would use if we were building from scratch. Uh, I mean, it's totally fine to build using what you've got laying around. You know, that's totally fine. And even if you don't have an Intel NIC, those can be had for relatively cheap on, you know, Amazon, Newegg, whatever. I got uh, a dual NIC, you know, two gigabit Intel NICs uh, on a PCI Express 1X card, and it was like 45, 50 bucks. So I can link to you, all that stuff to you guys. Just go over to the website, and there'll be plenty of options for you. All right, so Wendell, what else do you have in there? Oh, this board, I'm running five drives in this, five four terabyte drives. But the board only had four SATA ports, but it had an eSATA port on the back. So I've run a cable out the back and back in again for the fifth drive, which works fine. And now uh, the, the hard drives. Uh, how do you feel about those hard drives you picked? Well, it, it, we've had, you know, there's a lot of articles about hard drive failure rates and hard drive reliability and that sort of thing. And, yeah, so we've ordered about, for different projects, we've ordered probably about 24 terabyte Seagate hard drives. And, you know, four or five of those have died within the first 24 hours. So I'm not feeling super awesome about that. And we've had similar failure rates with the three and four terabyte drives that we've ordered from other vendors. So the build is a little bit on hold because I've only got four drives right now. Well, you're probably abusing them a lot more uh, than I am. But, I mean, I'm using three, three terabyte Seagate drives, and that gives me six terabytes of space. And I have been using it for over a year and haven't had any problems or hitches or anything. I'm actually kind of surprised this hardware is doing so well because the motherboard I have, it's got an AMD, uh, it's basically got an AMD CPU just right on the chip. It's just, you know, SOC. Um, and, and everything's been running just fine, even though it's very much not a real NAS build. It, it's, you know, it's running at full speeds. I've got two, you know, gig NICs. And um, I'm throwing a bunch of video to and from the drives. Uh, no, but no, I, I, these, these, it's not that much. I usually put through like a 24 to 48 hour 
like just really grueling stress tests just to see you know what the performance characteristic is. Sometimes uh, if you're if you're graphing the data, you'll have one drive that is like 20, 25 percent slower than the other drives, but is not actually throwing any smart errors or reporting anything. But that drive has, has also got to come out of the pile. And then that got that when that happens, that drive is selected for further really terrible stress testing, and you can be just about guaranteed that it'll be dead inside a week. I mean, this case in particular has got really good airflow. There are two fans, at the, two smaller fans at the front. The thing that blew me away about this is having worked on other systems, this is the first time I put so many 3.5-inch hard drives uh, in an ITX case, and this thing was still whisper quiet, and that's sort of saying something when you've got so many spindles on doing random access and crazy things like that. I guess it's the rubber dampeners plus the case plus, you know, the sound baffling in the front. I don't know, but the, the thing was really, really quiet, and that was the most disturbing thing. Now, with the Lee and Lee PCQ18, I actually really like this case. It's very easy to work with the side panels. They have a, uh, that they just pop on and off. There's just like a, a, a ball that goes into a a socket and they pop in, they pop out. I mean, there's a lot of Lee Lee cases out there that do that. Um, and then all the hard drives do have uh, these rubber, almost spacers that go on the sides and then you just slip them in. Uh, they like slide in on the rubber. So they, they're really nice and secure. And there's also a backplane in there uh, that makes it hot swappable for the four drives that are in the bay. And then on the bottom, you can put a couple more drives. So I did like the Lee and Lee a lot. It's smaller, sleeker looking. It's great. I've got it in the closet, you know. Uh, but it is noisier. Uh, there's a 140 millimeter fan in the front, so there's decent airflow. Um, but there's not as much room, not nearly as much room um, for cooling for your CPU. You don't really need it with the system on chip, but if you're doing like an i5 or i3 or something like that, you're really going to need it. Um, so I would not recommend this one for a, a beefy system, you know. But um, for something that's going to go in the closet, it's, it's a really good way to go. I think there are some ITX boards out there that even have more than six SATA ports, and if you wanted to go nuts, you know, um, if you wanted to use six drives with three NAS, that would be a RAID Z2 array, so you'd have four drives for data and two for redundancy. But the other thing I look for is if you really, really want the thing to absolutely scream, you can also add SSDs for caching. There's a, there's a write cache and a read cache. It's like the ZIL cache and the L2 ARC cache. Those are more advanced features slash properties of, of uh, ZFS that you get on FreeNAS, but you can use those if you really want to speed performance. Now, at home, I'm actually um, using the Thekus in um, uh, 5550 running FreeBSD. Like, I was able to get FreeBSD on that, and I'm sort of taking it to spin, so I've copied my media library to it and, you know, a thousand old episodes of the various star, uh, incarnations of Star Trek that there are and that sort of thing. And it's actually worked really well. Honestly, the biggest bottleneck even, and that's an Atom processor, and the biggest bottleneck with Atom is not really the ZFS overhead, it's the Samba, the SMB or CIFS, whatever you want to call it, the Windows sharing overhead. So if you're using it with FTP or SSH, it doesn't bog down. And, you know, I can write to the ZFS array at 200, 300 megabytes per second. But when you throw Samba into the mix, Samba is not really multi-threaded, and the Atom processor really just can't keep up. And so my Samba transfers are limited to like 60, 70 megabytes per second, and that's with a lot of tweaking. Whereas Nesferatu can easily manage 200 megabytes per second, no problem, and that's just because it's running an i3. Speaking of 200 megabytes per second, one thing that I want to note is if you're using uh, a dedicated NIC, like the dual NIC, especially if you're using the dual NIC and you want to do uh, some link aggregation, what I'm going to recommend that you do is plug the, um, I guess, install the motherboard's NIC first and just plug everything into that, open up the GUI, and then you can install uh, your other two and create your, you know, link aggregation group or whatever. Um, yep. Fortunately, with Nasferatu, since I didn't need to use a controller because of the uh, the cable out the back and in again, I was able to use a dual port Intel teaming thing and get around the, the on, I think it's an onboard Broadcom, so it's not terrible, but Intel is really the way to go. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's like this in the new version. I'm still running FreeNAS 8, and I haven't upgraded yet, but I noticed that it would not allow me to create the link aggregation group because I was already using one of the Intel NICs, and it's like it has to be on a NIC that's not currently in use or something like that. So I had to actually plug into the, you know, into the motherboard, the Realtek on board, and then create uh, my link aggregation group and then do it that way. So, And you're also going to need a managed switch for this. If you are someone who wants... 200 megabytes uh, plus per second, and you want both those uh, gigabit NICs, you're going to need a gigabit NIC in your main system. A lot of motherboards have them, and if not, you can just do like I did, and I grabbed a couple of those uh, PCI Express cards. 
uh, that's easy enough, but you're also going to need a managed switch that can, uh, that can handle this. They can take two of the ports and essentially make them one. And uh, there's also a ton of those on eBay right now for super cheap. So all those links are going to be on the website. You, now, you, can, um, you can also get a 10 gig Ethernet card on eBay now for about 150 bucks. Ooh, yeah, really? Yeah, the rebranded, or rebranded uh, Intel Nix as Dell is a really good alternative. Another, another thing you can do to sort of cheat fate is uh, you can get Dell, like, SAS 6 and better controllers for, like, 20 or $25. That's an 8-port controller that just gives you 8 ports, and it's a PCI Express by 8. There's no cache. The controller is terrible. But if you just want to run 8 hard drives, that's a PCI Express card that lets you do that. And because it's pass-through, there's no, you don't configure the RAID or anything on the card. ZFS needs direct access to the drives to work. We're, with NAS Ratu, we're also going to take a look at some other NAS products like <coughs> Synology. A lot of people have written us and, and said, oh, you should try Synology. I'm looking at the documentation for Synology, and I haven't seen anything that it, that it has a sane snapshotting system. I see a lot of people on the forum asking, hey, does it have snapshotting? Or I've enabled snapshotting, but all it seems to do is just create a point-in-time copy. That's not what ZFS does with its snapshotting. It's much more intelligent than that. ZFS uh, and FreeNAS can expose their snapshots on the shadow copy tab on Windows file shares. So you don't need any special software. There's nothing you have to do to get to the snapshots. And I'm not sure if Synology does that, but I have to have that feature. I cannot live without that feature. If Synology doesn't do it, it's a deal breaker for me. And if you're wondering, uh, even on Windows 8.1, if you have a NAS and you have enabled snapshots, you can browse it just like you used to be able to back in the Windows 7 days. You can browse it uh, just as if it were, uh, you know, a standard uh, Windows shadow copy type thing. Um, so it's sort of a way to get around uh, the shadow copy limitations on Windows 8.1. I mean, the, the functionality is still somewhere buried in there. They've just not given you access to it. Uh, but they do have you since you have it on your, your NAS, it'll work just fine right, right on your computer. Shadow copy functionality in Windows 7 is really awesome because it works on your local hard drives. In Windows 8, they've turned it off because we need to grab our torches and pitchforks and storm the castle and ask why they did that. So anyway, in this video, of course, as you see, we're not showing you how to build uh, we're kind of giving you guys some guidelines and letting you know what's available out there. And again, a lot of this is going to be on the website. If you guys do want to know how to build a computer, I mean, you build one computer, they're all going to be similar, just with maybe a little bit of extra finagling, maybe a few, you know, ins and outs that we, we didn't cover. But we did make a very uh, thorough tutorial on how to build PCs, and the fundamentals are still the same. So you guys can go check out that video, put together your own NAS. And the next thing you should do is watch uh, Wendell's in-depth uh, tutorial overview of FreeNAS. That'll give you a really good idea of everything you, you can do. You can see, um, I mean, pretty much all the ins and outs you covered in that, in that video, Wendell. Yeah, I'm sure that a bunch of FreeNAS veterans will send me hate mail, but the goal is to get you guys up and running with FreeNAS so you can get acclimated to it. It's a little different. It's a little outside the box. It's got just a tiny hump of a learning curve, but it's worth it, I promise. If you guys uh, value these videos, Please consider becoming a member of Tech Support. There's a button right over here. And uh, all the other cool stuff is on the side. And I think that's pretty much it. So we'll see you next time.